1993, my life was about to change in a big way. It was the summer, late summer, and I was about to become a single father and a performer, which I had been for years. So, in thinking about how I would best do this transition, I found a man named Sparrowheart, who had for years, and to this day still, does vision quests. And I went to the Gila Wilderness in New Mexico to meet him and one other quester from the West Coast. I flew out and rented a car, drove to a place that he had said we would meet. And interestingly enough, I was on this road that was a narrow pass headed towards this place I was going to camp for the night. And I had been right on that road years before with my comedy troupe headed for a show in, I think, Silver Springs, New Mexico. And it had been snowing and it was a really rough drive, but I was surprised. I was in the same place, the same road, but I veered to the right away from the path I'd taken before. I found the place basically was a, you know, a roadside thing, but very, very wilderness. So I camped that night and uh, it was cold. I had a tent, but I ended up in the sleeping bag, shoes, parka, everything. And I had a dream. And if I can remember, the basic dream was I was walking down that road, that very road, and there were two black panthers with me, which are very deep magic to me. One on each side. When I met Sparrowheart, the funny guy he is, the trickster, he said, was it Huey Newton? And I don't remember, but Black Panthers, you know, peace power. And it was funny. So off we drove, got supplies, and headed for this place deep in what used to be, or maybe still was to some degree, ranch country, huge amounts of land that you could just go and camp near a stream, which we did. And we spent the next few days, I stayed in my tent, stayed in the tent, and the next few days we learned about choosing our vision quest, building it. He taught us ways, first of survival, because we weren't going to be allowed to have a tent or a flashlight or a fire um, or food, just a tarp and a sleeping bag and water. So we learned and we studied and I wandered around the hillsides and started to sink into this place of quiet, a place I would be for a while. We completed the few days and he drove us from there to another place deeper into the wilderness. But You didn't hear those sounds. Right on a river. We hiked down this ravine and found our place to camp for the night. And we were told to go find our vision place. So we both went off together the woman's name was Joey. She was from uh, 
Whitby Island, Washington maybe. And we didn't speak. We walked for quite a while, crossed the river, and she went off and I found a spot. I knew immediately. It was right on the river and there was a giant sycamore tree there. Beautiful. Now this is October of 1993 and it's got color, the tree's got color. And we went back and we had our last meal and we slept under the stars. And I was laying there and I sort of heard this vibration. To me it was loud. And I said, you guys hear that? And Sparrowheart said, no. What does it sound like? And I said, well, frankly, it sounds like there's a sound coming from the earth. And he says, some people can hear the vibration of the earth. Little did I know. This is drug-free, too, by the way. So we're laying there, sleeping, sort of, staring at the stars. How can you sleep? I mean, you're about to go alone off into the wilderness for four days, fasting and uh, seeing what comes. And this is a wilderness, but I suddenly hear whack in the river, almost as if somebody had taken a shovel and slapped the water. So, in the morning we get up, and sh just a short distance from where we slept was a freshly killed beaver laying on its back, and there was nothing left of the insides, and big cat prints all around. Now, I'm talking feet from where we were sleeping. And this put a chill up my spine. So, um, we gathered up our water, gallons, I think a gallon, four gallons. I believe it was from the stream. It was pretty amazing. And, um, Sparrow did a little ceremony with Sage, protecting and blessing us, and off we went. Again, we didn't speak. We crossed. She went off, and I went off. Now, something we had chosen the day before was a spot to place a stone. And I would place a stone in the morning, and she would place a stone at dusk. So that when I went in the morning and she went at dusk, if there wasn't a stone, we knew there was trouble. And if there was, we were fine. So I footnote that there was never a problem. So we had the first day. And I had studied the concept of a death lodge and a purpose circle. The Death Lodge was a circle I created with stones around, each stone representing somebody in my life. My dad, my mom, my sisters, my ex, who I was getting a divorce from. And um, the idea here was to leave that circle, go into the new one, and be reborn into the purpose circle. Now, I was allowed <clears throat> any ceremony I had learned in studying <clears throat> native ways. I, I will say right now that I spent a great deal of time studying, talking to an, an Abenaki Blackfoot woman and learning and being with a psychic whom I knew and trusted quite well. And I was introduced to guides, and one of which was a native from another lifetime. <clears throat> so 
when I went there, I was prepared to be looking for things that I had learned in the sessions with the psychic through the native man. There was other guides too. And there I was. And night was coming on, first night, leading into the first day. And I, I, oh, I was allowed to have a fire. That's what I was getting at. This night as a ceremony that I'd learned. And the fire was a process by which you burnt sticks. And each stick represented an event or something like that in your life that you wanted to get rid of or give up to the Great Spirit. I had a mountain of sticks. <laughs> And it was because I had a mountain of things I wanted to send off. So I was there quite a while burning and going through my memories. Unbelievable things I came up with to release. And after I was done, I had um, a knife <clears throat> that was made in the way knives were made in the 1700s and 1800s, at varying things that were on, authentically made. There's a man named Traveling Medicine Dog that made this knife. And I put it in the fire. <clears throat> and one of, the, <clears throat> one of the things you could do was to do a scarring, burn something into your skin as a memory of that particular day and that event that would stay with you. My name that I was given in an epiphany, I must say, a while back, I used to do pipe ceremony and one of the pipes that Traveling Medicine Dog made was a replica of a a cumtuck pipe that was dug up in the Deerfield, Massachusetts area, and it had a little bear on the bowl on the front, kind of looking into the bowl. And you would do ceremony to the directions, six directions. So the knife is in the fire and it glows hot, and I um, put a symbol of my name, which I'm not going to speak, on my arm. And actually, it's weird because it didn't hurt. I don't know if you can still see it. Oh, you can. There it is. Yep, and you can try to figure out what that was because I'm not going to tell you. Some things aren't spoken to other people publicly. So I burnt it. I stepped into the purpose circle and I slept there that night, my first night. And you gotta know this is a place you check your shoes for scorpions, and there's rattlesnakes, and there's bears, there's javelinas, there's mountain lions. You name it, it's there. So I'm a little freaked. I was worried going there. I was worried on the plane. Here is my first night. So I slept. I got up. And there's this dead snake a few feet from where I had slept. So I started wandering around. I had my jugs of water. First day, no food. You know, I was getting hungry through the day. And I climbed this little hill and sat in the sun. The nights were cold. The days were, I don't know, probably 60s. And... I was sitting there thinking about my mother and
wondering if she was near and just felt her presence that day as I wandered around. Yeah, I was kind of happy. There was a way I could just be. I could feel my mother around me. I could sense her. Lots of thoughts were starting to come through my head. And that's about all I remember of that first day. The second day, I'm getting hungry and my dreams are nuts. I mean, all kinds of vivid, vivid stuff which I journaled. But I do remember dreaming of a pizza. Oh man, I could smell it in the dream. I was hungry. So I crossed the stream, the brook, the river. It was up to my knees in some spots. It was really nice because it was warm, you know, I could lay in the water, just lay there, it's cold. So I found this um, a dry kind of stream bed. I followed along the way and it led to an abandoned silver mine. On the way, things started to come to me and based on the relationship I had with my father, that was one of the first things that was coming out. Now, he and I became friends at the end of his days through my doings, but we had turmoil and I wasn't happy for a lot of, a lot of the time. And I got really angry on this walk and I started picking up giant boulders and smashing them, anger angry as hell that I wasn't treated the way I thought a young son should be treated by the father, you know? Camping trips, fishing, you know, I love you. <laughs> Read a story, tell a tale. I got a little of the tale telling. I got a bunch of tale telling about his life. I did interestingly enough. And he was sad. He was hurt by his parents, physically and emotionally. And he didn't know how to stop it. So he kind of passed it on to me. And it was up to me to get rid of it, end that guy, and move on. So I kept walking and you got to understand that it's a vision quest has events that happen. But for the most part, it's like the ending of the first movie called The Incredible Shrinking Man. At the very end, this is a black and white movie. I loved it. At the very end, no one could see him anymore. He was so small. And he'd found his way out to the front lawn. And what were blades of grass looked like trees. And that's the way you feel on a vision quest, for the most part. You feel, at first, you're a foreigner in a foreign land. But then, you feel you're a part of it. You're a part of everything. And so the experience that I would relate would just be being, just being. So I go up to this mine and I walk in a little bit and realize there's nothing for me there. All through the vision quest, I got a sense as to where to go. And uh, I started back. On the way back, In the stream, the dry stream, stream bed is a dead owl and it's warm and it's not stiff and it's daytime. Now, owl is a purveyor of wisdom, 
Um, people think they're magical. The natives call them the deceiver feathers. Their wings are called deceiver feathers because they don't make any noise. So they can hunt at night and their eyes can see in the dark. So this is profound to me. So I took and I cut it up. Sorry, but I did. And I took the wings because those are really revered things in the native world. And I would take them home with me. So that was end of day two. And day three, I spent just being near the space I was, being near the river. And I was sitting there and a bald eagle flew by, very close to me too. And then a herd of javelinas, they're little wild boars. And they can be aggressive. I didn't budge, they were making all kinds of noise going all over the place. And I said, when they left, I said, oh, I'll take a little jaunt then. And I found this cliff. If you looked up, it looked like a cliff. And I was pretty adept at climbing without ropes and stuff. So I climbed up, it took a while. And when I got to the very top, it was a flat spot. And there were tracks of a bear right by my hand and I look straight and it was a perfectly shaped right out of uh, Doonesbury bear cave and I'm looking right at it and I'm thinking you know who's home so I went down very quickly and I went back to camp now you also have to remember that I'm not going back to my notes. There's more that happened, but these were the important moments. And I was really getting hungry now. So we were supposed to be there four days and uh, four, four nights, I guess it turns out. But the last day is the big day. And fortunately for you, I'm cutting this thing to the quick. Now, remember I said that there was a native in the readings by this medium that I went to. And he taught me a thing. He said I would see a purple bird. Look for the purple bird. So the last day, I take off and I'm walking and I can't really tell you where I'm walking. I'm, it's it, the place is set up that if you go anywhere, you pretty well climb up. So if you get lost, you go down. So I'm pretty confident. I'm in the woods, you know, and the Western woods aren't thick like we have with ground cover or anything. You can see between the trees. It's just beautiful. And all of a sudden, on the ground, kind of hopping around, is a bird that's pretty well purple and blue in color. And I uh, started to hear that sound that I heard the first night, that humming sound coming from the ground. And I saw the bird. So, I followed it, and it clearly seemed to be wanting me to follow it. I followed it through the woods, then I kind of wouldn't see it, but I'd know which way to turn and which way to go, and then I'd see it again. And this went on for quite a while, actually. And... Uh, I came out of the woods onto um, 
a crest of a hill way up. I'd, I'd walked and not really noticed that I'd gone a long way. So I'm on this crest of this hill looking down into the valley of where I was camped and across a great expanse. And I sat down because I was pretty tired at this point, very drained from not having eaten. And I'm looking out and two ravens come flying out across and they're in perfect sync. I mean, everything they do is synchronized. They even rolled over and they danced. And this went on for a while. And I was, oh, wow, <laughs> man, it was beautiful. It was so beautiful. And it felt very much aimed at me. And the raven is an amazing medicine totem, as is the crow. <clears throat> Some of my favorites. So I lay down, because I'm kind of tired. There's more to climb if I decide to do it. It's an escarpment. It's like a, you know, hand over foot kind of thing. I lay down and my arms are stretched out on the ground. <clears throat> and this vision of Jesus came to me. <sighs> Jesus always been a fan. Uh, I mean, a fan of mine. He's been a fan of mine. Yeah. I've been a fan of Jesus forever. Christ consciousness. But I remembered when I'm laying there with my arms stretched out of Christ on the cross. And in particular, I went to St. Bernard's Catholic Church as a child. And on the way in, to and back from middle school, I would pass the church. One time I went in, they left the bottom part of the church open where they had a smaller place. Um, the large church was upstairs. So I went in and uh, I went up to the front and kneeled and or knelt and prayed. And they had um, these votives, little candles, and you light them for people that have passed or pretty much something like that. That's actually where you did your penance. When you went to confession, you went up and knelt and said your five Our Fathers or five Hail Marys, depending on how bad you were. But you were supposed to pay, I can't remember, a quarter, a nickel, something, to light the votive. And there was a little box with a chain on it, a little chain locking it shut, a little metal box. It really looked like something from medieval times, you know. Pay to pray. No, I didn't pay. I, I prayed anyway. So I was alone down there, and I'm leaving, and I'm leaving. I'm going out the foyer, and uh, there's a big statue of Christ on the wall. I guess I'd seen it before. I must have. It was huge. And Jesus was quite buff, actually. And he had the dripping blood from his hands, his side, his feet. And he looked unhappy. So I, <coughs> I looked at him and I said, why would you do this? Why would you go through this? And that image came back to me because I was laying on the ground with my arms outstretched. So the whole journey <clears throat> became this thing where beacons of meaning through my life. I mean, I went absolutely through a whole lot of my life. 
<clears throat> for those four days. And I looked up at the escarpment <clears throat> and said, no, please, I'm tired and I'm hungry. I want to go home. And he am. <clears throat> I climbed it. Up, 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 up. I'm like what now? 46. And uh, very good shape. Where? Very good shape. Except I had a bad back at that time. And I'd, uh, I trained in Taekwondo and I had to take time off because my back was hurting and when I was performing it got in the way. I actually fell. I was on a table standing on a roll of bola, you know, the little cylinder and juggling and just like God just swiped me and I went up in the air, slammed on the table, fell down, and went quiet. This was a great show too. I was and I was passing the hat besides being paid and I got a hundred bucks in the hat because when I popped up I made like I didn't get hurt and they went yay but I had this problem so I'm climbing up the escarpment I get to the top and this is another get to the top one put my hands pull myself up and whoa almost right in my face a flock of doves come flying out and I almost went ass over tea kettle down the hill down the mountain, but I didn't. So I got up, I sat, and I could really see. I could actually see so far as to, to see people on a road way far away, which I didn't like. I didn't want to have anything in my vision that reminded me of humanity, but though they were there. And I could see down towards where I was camped and I could see a pinnacle stuck down the hill quite a ways. Pinnacle, this one, if, if you made a giant chimney out of stone and stuck it somewhere, that's what this thing looked like. So I'm sitting there thinking, you know, it's the last day, my night's coming, the night you stay up all night, and you stay in your purpose circle, you're not allowed to leave it from dawn, no, dusk till dawn, and cry for visions. So I'm there thinking, what, what is all, what have I learned? What is this thing? And I look next to me, this is all stone, and there's this little pine tree growing up out of a stone. And I went, wow. What the heck are you doing up here? It was sort of a question I had just asked myself. What the heck are you doing up here? So, uh, um, I don't know. I don't get it, I say. So I climbed down. I'm walking back, headed for my day. This is... This is still around noon. And uh, it dawned on me that the tree had a story to tell, which was, if I can do this and I can survive, you can do what you need to do and you can survive. And that just went boom in my brain. So I go down and I see this pinnacle and I climb up because kind of, Three quarters of the way up is a little spot you can climb into and sit. And I'm sitting there and flitting through the trees below is the purple bird. And it kind of looked at me and flew away. So I went down, I went back to my spot and we still had an afternoon yet. Now, it's October, so dark came a little earlier, you know. So, I'm bored. I'm ready. I get in the circle, I don't know, five hours, six hours early, before sun, 
sunsets and I start doing yoga. And I lay there and I decide, I'm going to think of every thought and thing that's happened to me that I can remember starting from day one. So I started with this thing of me climbing out of my crib when I'm three. And not in the nighttime, my crib was in the living room of a rented apartment that we had. I had two sisters and me and my parents. And I'm walking down the corridor because I want to go see my parents. And the ceiling falls out just a couple of feet behind me and crashes. My dad comes running out, looks at me, looks at the floor, looks at me, looks at the ceiling as, as if to say, the heck did you do? in your diapers or whatever. That was my first memory. And I went on. And it went on for hours. I did this for hours. I'm serious. I did this for hours. Until I hit about 18. And then I said, I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. Now I mentioned my back before because I had taken, had to take time off from Taekwondo and I hadn't been able to do a lot of this stuff, especially my forms. So I started to slowly go through my forms in the circle. And uh, I was able to do it gingerly, but I could. This was the first time in like three months. So the sun began to set and the moon rose. And I'm not sure which direction I'm thinking. Because as I sat there, I think the moon rose from the east. And it took all night. It was full, by the way. October. <clears throat> 30th? 1993? So I had my sleeping bag in the circle because it got really cold and I had to stay awake all night and look for visions, cry for visions. So I'm sitting there, I'm laying there now and looking up at the moon and it's a very clear sky and I see the teeniest cloud form way up above my head. And it grows. It starts to grow. And it actually takes a shape. It took the shape of an owl. It looked just like an owl. Big thing. Expanded. Above my head. <clears throat> I had just cried for a vision, by the way. <clears throat> and it dispersed. And then there was a clear sky again. Later on in the night, I cried for a vision. When you say you cry for a vision, it means you ask. You feel ready for a vision. So I did it again. <clears throat> and lo and behold, across the sky above my head, as I looked, <clears throat> was an actual owl. <sighs> and it went into the sycamore tree. You know how they, when they land... Their wings flutter a bit, you know. So I saw that landing. And, uh, but I couldn't see it. And there was lots of light on the tree. And he, there wasn't enough leaves to cover it. It wasn't there anymore. It was gone. And I'm doing this. First of all, before you cry for a vision, you, you have big doubts like, this going to work? And it did. So I waited again. And uh, it's deeper into the night. <clears throat> the moon is traversing the sky. And I start singing these songs in between doing Tai Chi and Taekwondo. And they were songs from my kids 
Native American camp run by the woman who kind of taught me a bunch of stuff and her partner, a traveling medicine dog, who made a bunch of stuff for me, pipes, knives. <clears throat> so I never forgot the songs because they sang them at the end of camp and we used to sing them at home and it went, Sheena Sha, Sheena Sha, Anagona Sha, Anagona Sha. We're going home, we're going home. And I kept singing it and I said, I would have a vision. And lo and behold, twice in my life, years back in Arizona and now, I saw a supernova. It's a ball of fire, basically. Light that comes out of the sky. And I guess when it hits our atmosphere, it just explodes. And for one, two, the entire place is daylight. Boom. And this thing went shoo, boom. And interestingly enough, um, after this whole thing is over, Sparrowheart said he saw it. So it's that night, it's the last night, and I just sat there and watched the sun slowly come up. I'm still in the circle, and it's time to leave. But I don't want to leave. I thought I'd be headed for the exits, you know, let's go get that pizza. But I felt like I was home and I didn't want to leave. So I stood up, started to walk. And by the way, I checked stones every morning and Joey, woman from Washington State was alive and she was there waiting so we met at the Stones, nothing was said. We walked back, nothing was said. We met Sparrowheart and we drove back to that first camping spot. And we spent the afternoon relating what we experienced to him. And the next day we came home well, we did go out to eat, and I ate too much Mexican food, I can tell you that. And I flew home, and when I got home, my wife was there. It was her last day in this house that you see behind me. We'd been in the house together since 79, and now it's November 1st, 93. And she met me at the door and we said goodbye and the journey began.